Hello, I am Lux. And I'm Ember. And we both love the movie Frozen. But it's one of those movies that leaves you with questions. So here are 10 questions that we thought of that Frozen made us ask. Obviously spoilers. Our opinions, we love the movie, don't hurt us. Question number one. How does no one know about Elsa's powers outside of the family? An entire castle full of servants. No one has ever observed anything, walked in on the girls playing, caught Elsa when she accidentally froze something. And what about later after they reduced the castle staff and everything? Elsa can't stay locked in her room the whole time. You know, life doesn't work that way. Well, one of my some of my answers to this is when she was younger, I don't think there was many mistakes because she was happy. And the key to this is the more she's afraid, the more her powers get out of control. But the more she's happy, the more in control she is. So when she's younger, she's more in control. So I don't think the servants really realized she had powers because it looked like Anna and Elsa did a lot of playing by themselves at night to probably keep things, you know, under wraps. Yes, but they're laughing and giggling and in a castle full of parents and staff, no one's ever heard that and gone to check on them? They're princesses. Don't they have a nanny or a governess? Good point. Do you have any answers to it yourself? Ah, um, that nobody expects a girl to have powers, therefore they're not looking for signs of it, and anything they may see, like some frost on a window or an object, can easily be explained away or just not noticed. Question two. Who's been running the kingdom? I mean, the girls are orphans before do you want to build a snowman is over. By the looks of it, at least Elsa may be old enough to quote unquote run it, and I think she may be running it through the door, so the servants come up to her, she tells them what to do, and then so on and so forth. And maybe Elsa is doing little stuff, but nothing really big. So they may be running the kingdom kind of remotely, or by proxy, if I use that term correctly. <laughs> See, we have it heavily implied that Elsa never leaves her rooms. So is she submitting everything to the council in writing? And why would the council listen to her? She's a little girl. Okay, I know she looks more teenagerish by the time the parents die. But still, we have the entire implication that Elsa never leaves her rooms. Well, I think, like I said, by the time the parents are dead, she's old enough to run the kingdom and the people come to her and work out some type of deal or something. I think she actually doesn't um, leave the castle, but she stays in her room a lot. But I think by the time her parents are dead, she comes out of the room more and does stuff inside the castle. Which then brings up the question of how did Anna never manage to corner her, spending all that time trying to get a hold of her and running around the castle? I don't really know, but on to question number three. What about lessons for the girls? This goes back again to the heavy implication that Elsa never leaves her rooms. I know that they are princesses, but I think they're close enough in age that they would probably share tutors. If the parents were trying to reduce Elsa's contact with other people, who taught her anything? Okay, obvious answer of parents because they're in on the secret that Elsa has powers, but they can't teach her everything. Hello, they're supposed to be busy running the kingdom. Well, I think there's some indication in the movie that you're right, that the parents do a lot of the teaching. So maybe it's the mother, because it's usually the king who does most of the actual governing of a kingdom. The queen is there, but if I remember correctly, they're not really that important unless the king's not there. So I'm guessing the mother does a lot of the teaching. Yes, but she still can't teach the girls together, so she has to spend equal time with Anna, or Anna's going to feel even more alone. And then still, their mother can't teach them everything. They would still need lessons after their parents died. So who picked up the training then? We see in Do You Want to Build a Snowman that Anna has a lot of free time. <laughs> she really shouldn't. She's a princess. She should be at lessons or at her embroidery frame. Oh, that's apparently something I didn't know. Embroidery frame? Question mark? <laughs> yes, to keep the fabric br from bunching up while you embroider. My works always come out better when I use an embroidery frame. No, I, I didn't realize princesses did a lot of embroidery. 
women tended to do a lot of needlework, both the actual noble maidens and their female servants slash retainers slash entourage. Hmm. Well, the more you know. All right. Question number four. How can Elsa make living creatures? This one, I'm not quite sure about because the snowman she first created wasn't living. Maybe somehow her power has evolved to be able to imbued life into things because subconsciously she was lonely when she started playing around with her powers. That's why when she created that snowman, he became alive later. And then when she created the behemoth, she was afraid for her life and needed a protector. So His Maybe name's Marshmallow. What? His name's Marshmallow. How do you not know this? Because apparently I wasn't paying attention to that. <laughs> okay, Marshmallow. The big, terrifying marshmallow. <laughs> and I'm thinking she created him because, you know, protector. She needed someone, so subconsciously she somehow gave it life. I'm not quite sure about the technicalities or the um, logistics of how she did it, but I'm thinking it comes out of a subconscious thing. Olaf, loneliness, marshmallow, fear, needing a protector. But it's completely out of line with the rest of her powers. All of her powers have been ice and snow and cold, so all of a sudden she's able to create living creatures, because they're not just automatons, because we see distinct personalities. Well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that even though it's cold and snow and ice like that, it is water, and water is one of the elements that's usually associated with, the, with life or creation of life or healing. All true, but I still say it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Question number five. How does Kristoff not recognize Anna? Yeah, so Kristoff witnesses the original healing of Anna all those years ago. Then he runs into a girl that's the exact right age to be Anna. Same hair color, has the white streak in her hair that's so incredibly unusual, has a sister that is an ice queen, I know they play Kristoff as a little dense, but I would be drawing parallels there. I think it boils down to his age, actually, because I think he's probably at most five, six, if you're really stretching ten. And I barely remember anything from back when I was that young. <laughs> Unless it, like, was a traumatic event, and even then you would block it out. But I don't think, you know, he really retains that much. Though the fact that he's around the trolls might have something to do with it. I don't know. <laughs> well, when Kristoff goes to take Anna to the rock trolls, he says, I know they can help because I've seen them do it before. So he at least remembers the event. He may not remember the details of the event because memories get fuzzy and change over time. I think this is probably one of our weaker questions. But, you know, from our outside perspective, it's like, come on, how can you not realize that you saw this, you're dealing with the same girl. Reasons plot. <laughs> All right, and staying with Kristoff, but moving on to question number six. If Kristoff lives with the rock trolls, why does he need a job? And speaking of um, living with the rock trolls, how did that kind of happen? Was he like an orphan? <laughs> but moving on to the actual question, um, I'm thinking he just does it because he needs his own spending money to be able to go into town and get stuff. like veggies and other things for him and his reindeer because I don't think the rock trolls can provide him with cash for that. Well, I'm sure they can't, but the rock trolls had to be able to provide him with all of the necessities in order to raise him. So obviously they were able to provide food, clothing, and shelter up to the point that Kristoff was old enough to work. Well, maybe he just likes working. Well, he was trying to imitate the ice collectors when he was a boy and stumbled across the rock trolls, which makes it more sound like a hobby, which then makes you wonder, well, why is he so upset about the prices when he goes to get his supplies if it's kind of just a hobby and he doesn't really need any necessities? Maybe he, like most people, doesn't like the fact that things cost more or less. Well, I like when they cost less. <laughs> Most people like lower prices if they're the buyer. But I'm saying if it's not needful, if, uh, who am I kidding, if the price of my hobby went up, I'd be annoyed too. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Question number seven. The song Fixer Upper. Did Disney just advocate cheating? Really sounded like it. Get the fiancé out of the way and then the whole thing's good to go. Yeah, I mean, just like, okay, she's engaged to someone. Even though there's no ring, she says it. So, they basically just went, hey, you're with another guy. Dump him. Come with ours. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, by the end of the song, there's like the whole thing. You're getting married. I'm like, what? <laughs> what, do you have the power of annulment? I mean, jeez. <laughs> I know the whole song kind of relies on the fact that the audience knows that something's going on with those two and that she is not really, quote-unquote, in love with Hans. But, yeah, if you take it in the context of what's actually going on in the world, you're like, did they just advocate? Okay. <laughs> no, and it wasn't even like, oh, the guy you're dating is bad for you. You should be dating this guy instead, which is plausible. You know, try to convince her that she's made a bad choice, which they don't know the fiance. They just know one exists. But to just go, oh, so she's a bit of a fixer-upper. Let's get rid of the fiance and we're good to go. Yeah, that just does not sound right. <laughs> I mean, basically, the trolls don't know who Hans is, and the audience hasn't been led to believe that Hans is a bad guy either. They've actually been led to believe that he's a really nice guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a whirlwind courtship of Anna. Anna left him in charge of the kingdom. You know, he was taking very good care of the citizens, passing out blankets, sending him to the castle, you know, making arrangements. Mm -hmm. He was being a really responsible person who's like, okay, I'm doing all this stuff for the woman I love, and this kingdom needs someone to take care of it right now because they ha we have to figure out a way to stop this. And then at one point he goes off to stuff like that. I mean, they even lead you to believe that he really cares about Elsa in that one scene in the dungeon. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, all along he looks like a pretty great guy. And sometimes you can, like, go through a whirlwind courtship and actually do love the person, so this song just kind of... It, it Basically, it's out of context in its own world without even realizing it. Alright, number eight. Isn't Kristoff leaving and or him coming back an act of true love? I mean, he cares about Anna, but he left her with her fiancé so that she could be saved by an act of true love. And then when he goes, oh wait, I really do care about her. I have to care about her more than her fiancé. I'm going back and I'm going to make sure she's okay. Yeah. I'm thinking what's really going on is the act of true love has to be directly by her or something directly to her. Basically, something directly connected to her. Not it, For him, it's an act of true love, but not for her. It only becomes an act of true love later when she kind of realizes, oh, well, she, it only becomes an act of, I should say it's an act of love later. It's not an act of true love because she's semi-doing it for herself at that point. When she realizes, oh, I love him. I need to go and find him to get myself. That's kind of semi-greedy, so it's not an act of true love. It's an act of love and desperation. She thinks about it first, then does it. So I think that's what's going on here. And that's why her protecting her sister instinctively is an act of true love, because it's without question. Well, I'm not arguing the act of true love that actually took place. I'm just going, hmm, these are other, you know, brave and heroic acts of putting someone else ahead of yourself. She has to be more directly affected by it for it to be an act that will do something for her. And by her choosing to do that stuff, but instinctively going after her sister is the actual, you know, thing that triggers the cure. Well, she had time to make that choice, too. You know, she was running towards Kristoff to save herself, and then she saw that Hans was going to harm her sister, and, you know, went back. I mean, that was still a choice. You know, she also had the choice of trying to reach Kristoff in time, and then once she had all her strength back, going and strangling Hans. Her going for Kristoff is a choice for herself. Her going for her sister is a choice for her sister. That's the big difference. It has to be a choice not of yourself, but for someone else. Question 9. 
Why is Hans such a bad actor after Anna dies? Up until the point where Anna and Hans are alone together, and Hans is going, "Too bad nobody loves you," and you know dumps water over the fire and leaves her there to die. We've mostly thought he's a pretty great guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which means he's a really good actor. And then after he succeeds, suddenly he's like, "I'm hamming this up." Oh, she's dead! Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, she died. We barely had time to say our vows. <gasps> yes, and as my first act as king, I must order the execution of Queen Elsa for the murder of Princess Anna. Might as well just go moa ha ha. Because <laughs> it's just like it's something went from really good to why are you hamming it up? You're acting like you're acting. <laughs> I think what happened is up to that point, even the actor playing Hans thought he was a good guy, and then he got to that point in the script and went, I'm a bad guy? Okay. <laughs> so the actor started overacting to act like he's acting. <laughs> Which kind of made that point go, okay, why doesn't anyone sneeze feel this is suspicious? He's acting odd, even for someone, you know, with grief. <laughs> well, they're partially blinded by their own grief because one princess is dead and their queen apparently is responsible. But seriously, who believes unwitnessed wedding vows? You're just going to let this guy from some kingdom, you know, the youngest of what is it, 12 brothers, inherit your whole kingdom? I think it was, well, I think you're right, it is 12. At, at some point I thought it was 13, but oh well. <laughs> but yeah, suspicious. And even if you believe Hans and are stricken with grief. Your princess is dead in the other room. Is nobody going to go lay her body out in state? Either in her own room or, I don't know, in the chapel? You know, rigor mortis and everything? And respect for the dead? And hello, that's your princess? Huh. I don't know. I'm thinking no one would do it that quickly. So Hans has time to take care of stuff, and I don't think anyone, like I said, would take care of the body that quickly. Yeah, but if they go to take care of the body later, Anna's not there because she left with Olaf. Well, no one knows that at this point, so... Alright, so question number 10. Why does everyone clap when Anna punches Hans? Yeah, because at this point, no one has seen how bad Hans is. No one realizes that Hans is a bad guy other than the sisters and Kristoff. And there's a blizzard going on, so no one from that vantage point at the end of the movie could see that he almost tried to kill her and even at that point they could have justified that he was killing her to stop the blizzard or you know the sister because maybe they wouldn't have been able to see the sister but still by the point that they're on the ship no one knows that Hans is a bad guy so why are they still clapping saying one of the princesses punch him yeah because I mean even if you take in the fact that they suddenly go wait our princess is alive and our queen is with her yay you still don't know that Hans is a jerk and an evil villain. So you still don't have any reason for them to applaud Anna punching him, other than the fact that they're grateful their princess is alive. The only thing I can really think of myself is maybe they think she's punching him because he left her thinking she was dead or something? Because uh, really? <laughs> But I'm thinking it's mostly for the audiences because the audiences always like to see people in the show clap first and then they react to it. You know, that's one of the reasons we have things like laugh tracks and clapping, stuff like that in sitcoms. But at least in those situations, you know it's something that the characters in what you're watching aren't hearing. You know, unless you're doing a fourth wall breaking episode, the characters never hear the laugh track. This has been our 10 questions on the movie Frozen. Do you have any of your own? Do you have answers to our own questions? Please leave them in the comments. Please be nice. We really do love the movie. If you like my art, please visit me at DeviantArt and Tumblr. If you want more information on what Lux and I are up to, you can follow us on Tumblr. Really like Lux's art and would maybe like some of your own? He's currently accepting commissions. Links in the description.